Elise Tran, welcome to my living room. How are you? I'm well, thank you for having me over. My absolute pleasure. So let's kick into it. I want to go back to go forward because I think okay. it's always good to have some context, even though a short Google will actually tell a lot of people <laughs> all about you. Can we just go back though to corporate lawyer, mm -hmm. grew up in Adelaide, yep. started as a side hustle, yep. didn't work out so well. Uh -huh. Talk well, you know the story. So talk, talk me through the abridged okay, version of that journey. Brief two minute summary. So I studied law at the University of Adelaide and I was very determined to be a an amazing lawyer. So I actually, my first job out of uni was an associate to a court of appeal judge. Um, so I moved to Melbourne and worked for him. And for those who know about the legal industry, that's quite like a big accolade, I suppose, to work for a very senior judge. And then I worked um, at a law firm called King and Wood Mallisons. Um, and I, when I, you know, got these roles, um, I thought that that was my career. Like I would be in the legal industry forever. I, you know, whether it would be to make partner or to go in house at a big business or something. I was so sure at that time that that was my role in life. Um, I then met my co-founder of the Daily Editor, Tanya. I was actually seconded to Perth to work on a deal because this was during the mining boom. So this was like 2011, 2012. Um, went over to Perth, met Tanya. She was cool, dressed really well, had like cute chats around the water cooler or around outfits and stuff, you know, just to keep, keep ourselves going in this, um, corporate kind of hustle. Um, then moved to Sydney. Um, and Tanya called me up one day and was like, Hey, do you want to start a fashion brand? And I'm like, well, I guess like that sounds fun. Like I, and I didn't really know or even consider what that really meant. Um, and so we started a blog called The Daily Edited as a first channel um, and, you know, associated social media and stuff. And it was a daily edit of things that, you know, we enjoyed in food, fashion and style. Um, and then we launched a clothing line under the brand Edited. And I think it was a really cool idea and had, you know, maybe it's something that we can do now, but it was an edit of clothes, like a little capsule, a monthly capsule um, of clothes that you could mix and match and put together and were appropriate to wear to work. Um, and we tried doing that for around two years and it didn't really work. I think, you know, there were some, it's quite capital intensive to sort of be releasing collections every month and we didn't really quite get that. Um, but it was really fun because as we were still working as lawyers and it was cool to get things in like what was, you know, in Stella magazine on the weekends and stuff. And, you know, you're, you're both lawyers and you're seeing your things in print. So it was pretty fun. Um, and then in... 2014 we decided to move into leather accessories um put up some posts of some leather accessories that I had personalized because I love personalization and I'm sure we can delve into that more um and they just sort of blew up on Instagram and then that was 2014 and the rest this is, is now I mean we're talking about business as unusual and mm -hmm. so many people kind of go that just sounds so easy you know I'm a lawyer sure. I, <laughs> yeah. I'd, I'd turn into like this fashion yeah. entrepreneur overnight it but wasn't was, overnight if you look at the time frame <laughs> you know? that was still a side hustle so yes. I want to just for anyone watching this I want to put some perspective around yes. that like what's the mindset that it takes to go okay I'm a lawyer I'm going to try out fashion like where do you even start where do you even start I mean you just I never, I, I don't think Tanya and I thought that we would have a business of the size that we have today. Um, we didn't set out to even, I think at the time, quit our jobs. It was just something that we liked to do. And the rationale was, oh, like cool bonus money for clothes. So like, interestingly, the kind of financial target for the, you know, at the time was to make enough money to make, to buy a Chanel bag. <laughs> now I don't buy other designer bags because I use TDE. Um, but, you know, it was very small. It wasn't ever like um, we're doing this to quit our jobs and grow this business. It was just because we liked doing it. So that first iteration of the mm. business didn't work? Well, it wasn't, you know, didn't have commercial traction and was costing us more money than it was bringing in, so to speak. So this is important because I think yes. so many people start something as you did as yeah. a side hustle or a passion yeah. or a hobby and they haven't necessarily put the right business acumen, the systems and processes, the rigour and the regiment in yes. place. Um, so was it because 
you didn't understand the supply chain or you didn't have a big vision. I just think things vision. didn't get commercial traction in a sense that it didn't catch the imagination of a consumer. If you can create a product that sells on a you know fast turnover, it'll. I think all of that stuff will follow. So it comes down to product, whether you have relevant product at the right price point for the right audience. How do you go from when the fashion label and that initial iteration of the business wasn't working how did you then decide to turn it into leather-based goods and what was the natural progression so we decided not to produce more clothing because we had a lot of inventory and it wasn't selling to be honest Um, and then we it's not like we rolled straight into another idea it was a year of maybe selling some jewelry from other brands Um, I actually had a little greeting card subscription. I've always been very into stationery um, and work life accessories, which is why the daily editor is sort of positioned the way that it is. Um, and so we tried a few different things and the leather accessory thing happened when I was promoted as a lawyer um, and felt like I needed a compendium. And people are like, what even is a compendium? Um, but that's when I went to market and saw that there wasn't a lot of product in that space. So when you were deciding to come up with that product, Mm. was it um, a combination of something that you loved, something you personally needed, you'd had a bit of practice in the business world (laughs) and did you see a gap in the market? Was it a combination of It was a combination of those things. Even today, the things that we make at The Daily Edited are not necessarily finding a niche. It's because I want the product or I think it's cool and there may be no rationale for that. And it is, you know, a passion for the product. Amazing. So when you started, how did you find out, how do I get these products made? Like what's the supply chain? Because I think so many people start with a passion, a vision, a want to do something, but then it's like, where do I actually just start? How do I get these made? So where did you start? Yeah, I mean, I feel like Google, for example, is where, and I've honestly said that, there is so much information available to people now. Um, And what we created the first time around is not the final and the product and our product gets better and better as the years go on because we get more experience and we get better at manufacturing and um, you know there's innovation in the space Um, but for me I think you know in terms of messaging for people is just to get something out there even if it's not 100% perfect because if the idea is there then I think people will get around it. Done is better than perfect. Just start. Very good message. So a lot of people would start with a traditional bricks and mortar store. You started the other way around. You started online. So talk me through that decision. Did you understand more about e-commerce at the time than you did a bricks and mortar store? I had to be e-commerce because I was still working as a lawyer. So how on earth would I be working at Mallison's and opening a small shop on the side of the road at the same time. So naturally, because of how we were constrained with our full-time jobs, it was always going to be an online store. And I don't think there was any other option for us at the time. And it wasn't something like, oh, like, should we do e-com or bricks and mortar? Because we had our blog and our social media, it was just natural that e-commerce would be, you know, the first step. How big a part did technology play initially? I mean, how did you learn about e-commerce and how to set up a site? Was it Shopify? Was it WordPress? Like where <laughs> yes. did you begin? With so it was that? actually a WordPress with a WooCommerce, um, you know, extension. And that first site really stood us really well for a number of years, actually. Um, I just met some people like I... Um, initially had engaged an agency then that didn't quite work out like you know the costs of that blew out a bit and I met some people in freelance and I was very lucky to meet people who were happy to set me up and kind of teach me Um, and all of this stuff I'm not to say really oversimplify but something like Shopify which we use now um, are really simple things to use like if you can use Facebook then you can do e-commerce Okay, so most people would start the bricks and mortar store first. Obviously, you started with the online and the e-commerce platform. So why then did you decide to open traditional bricks and mortar stores? We decided to go into brick and mortar with our first pop-up store because customers were demanding to see the product in real life um, and we couldn't have people come to our office 
disrupt workflow to kind of go through our inventory and see what things they wanted to buy um, in that kind of environment. So it was very much driven by consumer demand. And that's a really interesting point because how do you get that tactile feeling? Like what platforms and channels do you use when people are just looking at um, your beautiful wallets or computer cases or phone cases online? How do you express that tactile element, that tangible element through digital um, channels? So I think there are two types of customers. There are customers who are very... Um, fluent at shopping online and are very confident with looking at an image of something or a video or a product to um, confirm that purchase. And a lot of the time it may be because they've seen it in real life and when they go back to online, they understand the quality of the product. Um, but then there are other people who can't, you know, imagine, which is totally fine. And they, you know, need to see the product in real life. So I think, you know, you can do a whole heap of things with your website, your social media, your content, um, but people are just different. What was the revenue split between bricks and mortar and online? So pre-COVID, 60% of the business was done online and 40% was done in stores, which surprises people. But because we have very few stores, they are very busy and are destinations for our customers. So I've been very connected to a lot of small businesses through this time. And I've noticed that a lot of bricks and mortar businesses have had a lot of problems repurposing their staff or knowing what to do. So what did you do in terms of transitioning your existing retail staff across 11 stores? It sounds like you were able to get them on the phones and interacting with customers. Did you have to let anyone go through this time or have you been able to pivot successfully? So we've been engaging our team with technology at a wider level. So our retail team members now have access to all of our social media from Pinterest through to TikTok. Um, they're engaged more with our inventory management platforms, which are generally quite heavy pieces of technology that we don't you know, put onto the retail floor. Um, and they're more engaged with our CRM than they ever have been. Now that we're doing business in a rather unusual way, do you see as we come out of COVID that there will still be the need for a combination of bricks and mortar and digital? Or do you see that actually things will become very much digital first for you? So a lot of people say that I'm very optimistic about physical retail and that may be because I like to go to the shops. I enjoy going to a high street, to a Chadston or whatever it is. I, because of the number of stores we have, and it's very few, I don't see closing any of them really. Um, we're probably on a nice minimum. Um, I think that customers, so I can see that people still want to go to shop. So I do think that, you know, in my view, and it might be very different to someone else's, that um, a retail presence is very important. Is that just from a, some people still want that tactical experience? And is there a way to give that in-store tactical experience online? Is there a way to emulate that using technology? I, I think about that all the time, Lisa. I find it incredible that, okay, so one of the things that is achieved at a physical level for our brand is that you can stick your head into the Chadson store and go like this and understand in one glimpse what we do because you see the personalization you see the product and you see someone buying something you're like I get it when you land on the dailyedited.com I can't provide that same experience um and so I do feel like at this point the technology is lagging behind what you can actually do for a customer in store sometimes um and I know that you know I will probably get calls from various e-commerce providers <laughs> after saying that. I know that there are uh, apps and things that you can do, but I still don't think it's the same as just that simple interaction that I just described. So there, are there specific sort of disciplines, rituals and routines that you've helped them to be able to work from home or work remotely? Have you set up certain things as a leader to help them kind of slot into this new way of working? So a lot of it is Slack channels with specific groups of people um, and dialing in on that group and just signing off on what they're doing every day. And when you're in the office, it's all about you can high five in the hallway, yeah. you can see each other, you can have coffee breaks, you can go to yoga at lunch, you can do all these things that bring the team together. Is there anything fun that you've been able to do for the team to help them feel like it's interactive and that they're part of something as a whole? 
So luckily we have a lot of physical product in our business. So for people who are not coming to the office or engaging, you know, with a physical store, we have been sending out, um, you know, packs of the latest stuff and, um, you know, ensuring they're engaging with that product. Because I think at the end of the day, our business is the creation of a product and the sale of that to a customer. So if you lose that connection, then there's no point. So that has been the main kind of thing that we've been doing that's keeping people involved and engaged. Nice. So your team are naturally evangelists and they're loving the product. (laughs) Talk to me a bit about influencer outreach and influencers using technology to showcase your product through this time. So, I mean, there's no surprise that we influencers have been a really big part of our marketing strategy being quite a big digital business. Um, I think, you know, just shout out to the influencers. They've been very good during this time in um, showcasing product that we have seeded to them. Um, We pivoted our product very quickly. So uh, we created a line of products that relate to working from home. Um, We have face masks coming that can be personalized. So, um, you know, all the products that we created are very relevant to this period of time. We're not sending someone an evening bag covered in sequins or something like, where are you going with that? So I think it's been very um, natural for digital influencers in the space to get behind our product. Very clever. Talk to me about flattening communication for stores. Sure. So, At an office level, our team isn't that big. I run quite a lean team and people are very surprised by that. Um, But our retail team, because of the work that goes on on a retail floor normally, is quite large. So let's call it 80 people. Um, To normally, normally what we were, we weren't communicating with them individually. I know it was really bad. Um, you know, there would be a weekly newsletter that would go out because there was no way to that anyone had time to speak to each individual person. Um, now we've kind of, we've scaled back with our casual team members and our full-time retail team members have been, you know, by and large taking the lead and feeding back um, changes in foot traffic, consumer preferences and stuff to us. Um, and so they have had direct more direct access to myself, our global retail manager, our office team have been instructed to support that team as much as possible. Um, And, you know, everyone's kind of getting around each other a bit more. There was a bit of a office versus store. um, And I've always tried to get rid of that. Um, It's one team, one dream kind of thing. But during this time, I think people's attitudes change a bit. So that has really helped with actually delivering one team, one dream. Nice. So customer service, has that changed remarkably during COVID? How are you coping with, like, what are, how are you actually communicating with customers? What are you finding is most effective and what are they enjoying the most? So customer service hasn't changed too much. Obviously, we've had a lot more inbound on the online aspect, but you know, that's logical. We did offer um, Zoom appointments with our customers um, if they wanted to make an appointment with a specific store in their local area or, you know, whatever it was. And what was very interesting was that a lot of people just wanted to have a chat when they, you know, utilized that service. Um, And People are, you know, the nice thing is is that people are a bit more relaxed if things aren't getting delivered to them on time and things, which is quite nice. Um, And we've just had to be more vigilant on phones because everyone wants to check to see if, if they're going into a physical store, they want to check to see if we have a specific product in stock before they make that trip. Um, Normally people are a bit more laissez-faire about that, Um, but now obviously trips are much more intentional. And what do you find are the main communication channels? Do they want to connect with you on Zooms or across social media or do they email you? So what what are you seeing most trend-wise? It's everything. So DMs, Facebook messages, phone calls, live chat, email, um, some of the FaceTime Zoom stuff. I think because people are working from home, I th- maybe they're Zoomed out. <laughs> um, they don't want to do that as much anymore. Um, we're launching a WhatsApp buy via WhatsApp service. Um, I, th- You know, for a long time, even outside of COVID, customers have just wanted to use whatever 
you know, communication tool they like the best and we just have to be there to catch the pieces. The main thing is, is integrating them all. Is there anything unusual or unexpected that you did to respond to customers? And by that, I mean this. My friend Jay Edwards of Edwards & Co. traditionally is a hairdresser, Mm -hmm. bricks and mortar. Everyone's going into the salon. He actually started sending out home dyeing kits. And it was kind of hysterical. I had my fiancé like trying to cover my (laughs) greys. And a lot of people, there was some backlash around that. Because people were saying, well, hang on, isn't that what we do in salon? But he has seen an extraordinary uplift because he really connected and communicated with his customers and gave them what they wanted and needed through this time. So have you done anything that previously you may have not planned or was unexpected to respond to your customers' wants and needs? So something very simple we did was add a little flyer to all of our parcels which said, hey, this is a crazy time. Thank you for supporting us. You know, hope you're doing well. Um, And people responded really well to that, even though I was like, that is something that to me is very basic to do. Because at the height of, you know, this pandemic for Australia, call it March and April, it seemed quite frivolous what we were selling. So I felt like it needed to have something else in that package to communicate with the customer. So that was a really simple thing we did. So for those of us selling, you know, day-to-day objects online, which are fun and amazing, how do we actually take a view of a higher purpose so that we can serve our communities in different ways and actually use our following to be a voice for good? I do think um, the role of a brand or a business has changed so much in the last year. And I think, you know, for us, the major turning point was the bushfires. Obviously, Australia was so affected by that and it started with us um, donating a day of our sales and we donated $200,000 to various, to the Salvos and the RFS and a few other organisations. And that has kind of changed us as a business because it was one of the biggest donations we've done as a business of our size. Um, And now we see this like responsibility to be a part of different conversations that are going on um, and reflect that in the content that we create and how we position our product. So the first thing I did once the pandemic had started was actually reshoot all of our content. So, and it's still, um, it's about to be changed over, but it was all about buying and purchasing from home because we and then we took out um you know a lot of imagery of our stores and things like that from our home page so we were kind of pivoting into what people um were doing and what the community was kind of expecting of us so when times are good i think it's easy for any of us to get complacent and not upskill what would you say is the most important thing for small businesses to prepare and future proof themselves i think you know for me it's just being cash conservative um and it sounds like it sounds negative because you know not hiring new team members and that sounds really bad but we're just you know trying to maintain um you know a decent level of business and not doing at this point in time and that may change in another month who knows um you know at this point in time it's just being conservative Mm. so is it about cutting costs and trying to increase revenue? Um, If you can increase revenue, of course, but it's a challenging time where you can't increase your distribution strategy in any way. Like, for example, if you were going to open it, you know, if we wanted to do a store in LA this year, we can't really um, sensibly look at that. Um, So I think it's maintaining revenue and maintaining, you know, a cost base rather than increasing costs and not being able to increase your revenue through no fault of your own, I think. So talk to me about um, TDE. Obviously, customer service is imperative. Mm -hmm. How do you keep it at the forefront of everything that you do? I am the head of customer service. So I actually do all of the DMs. Very few people know that. Um, I audit our customer service portal once a week. Like it is very much one of my key focuses in the business. And so that then ricochets across the team because if I am up in your grill about a customer I don't know it's not my friend or anything it is someone who is dm'd and said that they went into store and I've had a really bad experience and then I make that my mission to fix for the next hour how do you think my team members feel (laughs) 
So as a result of, I think, my attitude towards it, um, it is just something that is part of the culture of the Daily Edited. Between creative and operational, I would say I am a great visionary, a big thinker, a good leader. I see things before they exist. Operationally, IT, HR, <laughs> I'm not great. So do you supplement, how do you supplement your weaknesses? So I guess I'm able to do what I do because over the last five years, we've really built up Um, a fantastic team. We have team members that have been with us for four years, three years. And so over that time, they've been able to learn how I like things done. So even if I I am the person um, dealing with a customer who's had a bad experience in store, who's DM'd us, but I get to screenshot that and send it to someone else to send that customer a voucher or follow up with that customer. Um, So I have a really engaged team who understand what we need to do to continue to sell to our audience. Are there specific things if a customer does have a bad experience? And now with technology, I mean, we can respond in Mm. real time. Are there specific strategies that you engage to actually keep people happy? I think it's a case by case thing, but each situation is so different. And I think, um, you know, our overall philosophy is how would you feel if you were that customer and what would you need in order to shop with us again? So that's just the attitude that we take. Elise Tran, thank you so much. I had a great time. Thank you. Stay tuned now for our live Q&A.